Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome once again to Faith Fellowship Sunday School. We're still in the book of Colossians, and we're going to keep walking right on through it. And I hope you've been picking up little tidbits and things that are going to help you in your entire Bible learning, because it's important for us as Christians to know the Word of God. I've told you many times in the past, as we've gone through different books and studies, that context is important. And context in what I mean now or what I want to talk about or address right now is that you always have to take note of the fact that, that the Bible was written during the first century, the early church, where people are being brought out of idolatry and worldly thinking and paganism and brought into a whole spiritual, brand new spiritual paradigm or, or understanding. The, the world was steeped in idolatry. And so as Paul is preaching and teaching, keep in mind, he's talking to people that came out of darkness. Now, the same is true for us today, but today in today's world, especially in America, there is a certain amount of knowledge that most people have about the Bible. And I've shared this before, but I just want to bring you into remembrance. So there is a, a knowledge that we have because in America, we've been celebrating Christmas all, all of your life. So at some point, every child has asked, what is the reason for Christmas? Why do we do this? So in America, there is a fundamental understanding of the Bible on our dollar bill in God we trust. But in these days, the early church, they were steeped in paganism and idolatry. So Paul has to do a lot to change their whole mindset, to kind of awaken them and show them a whole new spiritual understanding. Now, the same is true when you think of, think of them in terms of innocence like a child. Children, you have to say to them, don't talk to strangers. I mean, uh, children would necessarily or most likely just speak to anybody or, or think everybody's nice or good, but we have to tell them not to speak to strangers or get in a car with a stranger. And see, it's kind of like that in Paul's time where he's taking vulnerable, innocent people and he's teaching them whole new things from the Spirit. So he labors hard to make sure that what they're learning, they won't soon forget or go back into their paganism or be deceived by people who would take their vulnerability or their innocence and try to corrupt them. So that is the context of the letters that Paul's writing to the churches. He's trying to take an innocent people group in a community, a church, a newly found church, and tell them that your whole mindset has to change. And you have to be careful to hold on to the little that you have and continue to grow in it so that you're not easily deceived or manipulated. And that's true today. That's why Bible study, as I've said before, is so important for you. That's why we walk through these as, as practical as we can, kind of line by line if we can, to try to establish some fundamental beliefs that you will never again be shaken or you'll never again be misled because of your own spiritual understanding, your Bible knowledge, and you being mature in the faith. So Paul is speaking to an immature group and he's telling them things about Christianity, something they had never heard of before. So now in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, let's start reading. It says, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea. Remember, this is Turkey, and this church is not very far from Laodicea. And for all who have not met me personally, so they've never met Paul personally, but he's trying to endear in them a relationship that says, guys, you need to know that I really struggle for you, that I labor for you. I'm not somebody who's trying to get some fr something from you. I'm trying to impart something to you. That's his goal. And so he says, 
My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What he's saying is, is that I want you to get the fullness of understanding and that understanding is completely contained in Christ. Nothing else, not tradition, um, not the wisdom of men or the intellect of philosophy, but it's in Christ. And so you and I, we are saved by faith, by grace through faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus Christ. That is the foundation that we're built upon. And so we can't change the foundation. The foundation has to stay in place. And Paul uses language like that as a building or an agriculture sometimes to help people understand what he's trying to impart. And he's going to do that in just a moment. But he wants them to have the full assurance and understanding that everything that we're about is contained, found in Christ. Then he says, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in, in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. That is the goal, that your faith becomes firm in Christ so you're not easily shaken. And the purpose or one of the purposes of Sunday school as we do from time to time, Wednesday night Bible studies, Sunday services, it is no different than what Paul the Apostle was doing. He was trying to strengthen people in their faith, in their Bible knowledge, so that they're not easily deceived by fine sounding arguments. And we're going to touch on that in a minute as well, because there are many fine sounding arguments today. And remember, Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. Things that happened in the past find their way into the present and even on into the future. So things have not changed. There are still arguments out there. There are still deception out there. There are still wolves in sheep clothing out there that's trying to manipulate people in the faith. That's who Satan is. He's a liar, a deceiver, a thief, a robber, and even a murderer. So he uses all of his tools in his toolbox to deceive people, just like he did with Eve. He took the word of God or her lack of understanding of the word of God and he brought mankind into a fall, into sin. That's why Jesus had to come and die in our place. You see, all of this matters. Let's continue. So then in verse six, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. So as you grow and as you mature spiritually, so does your worship. So does your gratitude, your thanksgiving. It increases as well as you grow because you realize what Christ has done for you. And so he's saying that to them. He wants them to share in his same rejoicing and thanksgiving because of what the Lord has done for him. And we're going to read about that in a moment. So being rooted. So he's using agricultural terms. They understood, okay, roots, uh, something is planted in the ground. So that means whatever is planted is planted into what it's, where it's going to receive its nourishment, its nurturing. And so when you plant a seed in the ground, it's from the ground that it gains the ability to grow. And when something, or when he uses um, architecture, a building, he's giving you the impression of a foundation, something that's firmly in place that cannot be shaken and everything you build on it is built on a solid foundation, Christ Jesus as Lord. That's what he's saying. And so he goes on, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Now, one of the things they were dealing with in the early church was Gnosticism or 
people believing some kind of spiritual enlightenment through knowledge. That's what Gnostic or Gnosticism is to know or knowledge. So you had to be a part of this secret hidden wisdom and knowledge. And you would recognize through Gnosticism that the body is evil and the spirit is good. So it doesn't matter what you do in the body, your spirit is good. So if there is a God, if you're going to go to some paradise type place, you're going to go, everybody's going to go because it's the flesh that's evil. The spirit is good. And that is not true. So that kind of teaching sounds good. Oh, you mean we can live any way we want because our sinful nature is just like that, which part of that, there's some truth to that. But it's just enough of a lie to mislead people. Yes, we have a sinful nature. We do. So that part of Gnosticism is true. But we only have a new birth or a new spirit because of what Christ has done. Not because you reach some level of knowledge or understanding. It's salvation in Christ. And so Paul is saying, be rooted. Let your roots grow deep and be firm May your foundation remain the same throughout your Christian life. It's built upon the rock, Jesus Christ. And so Paul is really laboring to make sure that because he's absent, he's not there with them, as he stated, that, listen, people are going to come in and they're going to try to manipulate you and deceive you. And so I need you and I need to know that you're firm in your faith. There are a lot of fine sounding arguments uh, there are a lot of things that would appeal to the flesh, even for a Christian. A Christian is told that you can live any way you want. You can do whatever you want to do because you're, you, you can't do anything about it anyway because your flesh is evil. But your spirit is going to be OK in the end. That is not Bible. That is not the Bible. So Paul is wanting them to be firm in their Bible knowledge, and the same is true for you. I want you, as well as myself, to be firmly rooted in what the Bible says and not some fine-sounding argument or a tradition passed down from the culture you may have come from, the culture I come from. It's faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Then it says, For in Christ, in verse 9, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Another thing that Gnostics believed is that Jesus really didn't. He, he the spirit of God came into that body when he was baptized and that man was just a man. And then before he died on the cross, the spirit left him. So God really didn't die. And that whole belief that we have that Christ lived a sinless life, born of a virgin and was tempted in every way, yet without sin and was crucified on the cross wrongfully. Therefore, he could pay the price or the penalty of all your sin and mine. If you take either element out of that away from Christ, who is the fullness, as Paul says, you take that out of Christ. What you have is a religion and not salvation or faith in Jesus Christ, according to the word of God. So it's important that we stay rooted, firmly placed on Christ. Then it says. In him, you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Now, he's almost turning a corner and he's talking about Jewish tradition that could really subvert the new believers into thinking they have to incorporate Judaism into their faith or they must be circumcised. And see, Paul is saying, no, 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 no. And all the letters that we've read uh, that Paul wrote, he's constantly dealing with Judaizers or people who were trying to make sure that Gentiles were caught up in uh, Jewish tradition more than they were caught up in Christ. And Paul 
has this encounter with Peter in the book of Galatians, and we're going to turn there and read, and we'll see that even though Peter was knowledgeable, he was a disciple, he walked with Jesus, he ate and lived with Jesus, he still showed signs of worldliness or tradition. So in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, turn there with me, to show you how Paul had to battle Judaism in his time so that Christians would not be confused because after all, Jesus was Jewish and Christianity kind of sprang forth from Judaism. So Paul had to win this battle of trying to make sure people understood the difference between the two. And Peter being the wise and knowledgeable man that he is, he still had to deal with his flesh. So in verse 11, Galatians chapter two, Peter comes down to Galatia with Paul where Paul is, and then some men come from James or the hierarchy in the church in Jerusalem, and it changes the environment. So verse 11 says, when Peter came to Antioch, which is in Galatia, when he, when he came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James or from Jerusalem, he used to eat with Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belong to the circumcision group. Or he was afraid of Jewish traditional, traditionalists and those who were steeped in the Jewish culture. And his job, Paul's job, was to bring understanding to the fact that we were in a new covenant. And Judaism, it mattered to Jewish people, but for us, we're not trying to go back to the law. We are faith children. So Paul says, the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? You see, Paul was dealing with that his whole lifetime as he was building churches. And so Paul can speak on this with great eloquence and experience. So in the same book of Galatians, in chapter one, I want to read something to you about Paul's background that lets you know exactly why he has to be a chief proponent of the gospel, making a clear distinction between Judaism and Christianity, because Paul, when he didn't understand Christ, it led to something occurring in his life and it caused him to do things to people who he thought were heretics. So it says in Galatians chapter one, verse 11, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. You remember Paul's experience on the road to Damascus, how the Lord blinded him, brought him off of his beast, his animal, and he went to Syria or Damascus and he was taken to a place and Ananias was sent to him to tell him that God was about to use his life. Acts chapter nine, if you want to read that. It says, for you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism. They probably had. How intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. So Paul knows what he's talking about. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not consult with any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter 
and stayed with him 15 days, I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I'm writing to you is no lie. Later, I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. So what Paul is saying is that he understands the mindset of Judaizers or people who were trying to remain strict traditionalists to the old way, the old culture. And he would have to accept he learned the gospel from Jesus Christ himself. He didn't go consult any man to ask them or the apostles, as he just stated. He didn't go to the apostles first. So teach me about Jesus. Teach me how he was. And so I'll understand him better. Share with me what that three and a half year experience was like when you guys walk with him. No, he didn't do that. He went into Arabia and he learned at the feet of Jesus Christ himself by revelation. That's what he's saying. So when he preaches the gospel, he's looking at it from both angles. One is, I understand the zeal of the Jews to try to get Gentiles to turn at least to some degree in Judaism. I understand that desire that they have to do that. However, I understand with greater authority from Jesus Christ himself that that doesn't matter. That is the old covenant. We are under the new covenant. And then after he learned the gospel message from Christ, then he went to see the apostles. Then he started to consult with them, perhaps ask them questions. What was it like living with Jesus and spending time with him personally in bodily form? What was that like? So here he's telling us the gospel he preaches is it's it. It's the real deal. Now watch this. He even says something more severe and critical than that. He says in the same book of Galatians, chapter one, verse six, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we've already said, now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. In other words, he's repeating it to make sure that they get the point. And so when he's writing to the church at Galatia, he, they had turned their back or they were walking away from the message of Jesus Christ and getting caught up in Judaism. And you can see Peter was acting in hypocrisy when he was around them because he was trying to make sure that he was in compliance with his Jewish brethren and not acting like a Gentile, but still like a Jew. It was hypocrisy though, because Peter knew the gospel of Jesus Christ. He knew, and Paul had to rebuke him to his face. Sometimes we'll have to do that in Christianity. Sometimes we'll have to rebuke people that work their way into the body of Christ and they come in with fine sounding arguments. They come in with their own agendas even today and they take advantage of the vulnerable and they take advantage of innocence just like the devil did in the garden and just like people have always done in history past. Because when you are innocent like a child or new in your faith, you're very, very vulnerable. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment about what heresies look like and how they find their way into the church or godly people or how people are drawn away from the faith with religious arguments. See, now listen, I only have 30 minutes or so during a Sunday school lesson and sometimes I probably talk fast or I'm trying to get a lot of points across in a very short window of time. So forgive me 
if I throw a lot out at once because I'm trying to get as much as I can in a single setting. So that's what happens sometimes. Now, I told you that people have always brought heresies into the church. That's not new and it still happens today. And it's important that you and I are firmly rooted in our faith. Now turn with me to the book of Romans chapter one. I'm gonna show you something that is happening in our day that we need to be very, very careful of as believers because heresies have to have a religious sense to them and a moral sense to them or a something about it that makes you seem like you are being spiritual. Let me give you an example of what that means. Today, there are terms like inclusive or trying not to be exclusive or uh, embracing other thoughts and beliefs and understanding other people in their backgrounds and their experiences. And how are we as Christians today going to say that we are a loving people when we exclude certain groups? That's something we're dealing with today. That is a, a concern of mine and I'm sure probably yours as well. We're dealing with that today. We have to be understanding and accepting and we don't want to be considered bigots and uh, we don't embrace everybody. It's a real touchy argument today because everybody wants to be included in Christianity, but they want to bring with them their own beliefs and Christians are supposed to embrace them, although what they believe is contrary to what the Bible teaches. Therefore, when we are strictly adhering to the Bible, we might look or sound to them exclusive and not including everybody. Therefore, we're no better than anybody else, which we're really not. All that we are, are saved and sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit by faith in Jesus Christ. So in Romans chapter one, Paul gives us a little bit of an indication of things that we're dealing with today. Romans chapter one, starting in verse 21. For although they knew God. Now, that could be a direct statement to America. America, come on. If any nation knows God or anything about God, it's us. We are founded. Our founding was on biblical principles and God we trust, uh, endowed by our creator with unalienable rights. And so our documents are rooted in God, although uh, flawed men wrote it. I don't want to hear that argument. Um, whoever writes it, if you had wrote it, it would be flawed uh, or a flawed person would be writing it. So let's not deal with that. Let's just deal with what was said. And so America knows God. Then it says, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's happening right now, today. It says, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. There are people talking heads on television every day in news shows and things that you watch. They have the alphabet soup under their name and they're saying things and coming from them with their education and background and learning, they must be right. No, they sound like it maybe to some degree, but their hearts, foolish hearts, have become darkened and they start preaching and teaching heresies. Then it says, and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. You can't tell me that today is not a clear picture of that. They exchange of, 
exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. There are people who are worshiping the environment. And if you don't care about the environment, you can't be godly. Or if you don't care about the environment, you're not godly. And if you don't realize the the earth and the environment is more important than mankind, um, something's wrong with you. We have to do everything for the sake of the environment. Mother Earth, the earth is not my mom. And so these teachings, they're not new. They've been around forever. So it goes on. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged their natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. You see, today, you're not a good Christian if you don't embrace everything. You're not a good Christian if you're not inclusive of everything. And so we need to reinvestigate the Bible and find out that it was written for a previous generation. And today, because of science, we've learned different things now. And now we have to kind of shift our understanding. The Bible is still a good book, but it's in error as it relates to sexuality and different things like that. So as Paul is writing these letters and so passionately preaching the gospel and wanting to make sure that the people remain rooted, grounded, and remain solid on the foundation, Christ, the word of God, he had to labor to do this and he felt he had all kinds of opposition from every side, Gnostics, Judaizers, and everything else, I, idol worships, idol worshipers, everything. But he suffered much for the gospel so that he could maintain its purity so that we today can walk in godly wisdom. So, you're a Christian because of your faith in Jesus Christ. That faith is understood and established in the word of God by God as he, by the Spirit of God, inspired men to write. Not their own private interpretation, but write as the Spirit gave them the words. So this is not a book that is inspired by man. Man is inspired by God, but men wrote. And so the scriptures are not a private interpretation where we can actually insert or change whatever we want. In fact, the book in the, the book of Revelation tells us there's a curse on anyone who would change anything in this book, in this revelation. So Paul was zealous to, to preach the word of God then, and we should be no less zealous today to preach the word of God now so that you may remain rooted and built up in your faith in the word of God. And the word of God is the Lord. Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God and the Word became flesh and it dwelt amongst us in the person of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Have a great week.